afternoon and welcome to the Tune In to Safe Healthcare webinar series featuring today's presentation, Infections in Dialysis Centers, Understanding What Matters to Patients, hosted by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. CDC's mission is to save lives and protect the health and safety of Americans. My name is Preeti Patel and I serve as a medical officer within the Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I am also the director of the Making Dialysis Safer for Patients Coalition. This webinar is part of a series of infection control related educational webinars that CDC hosts along with a variety of external partners and experts. Before I introduce our esteemed speakers, I'd like to say a few words about the topic of today's webinar. This slide shows CDC's core interventions for prevention of bloodstream infections in dialysis centers. One of the interventions is patient education and engagement. Yet there is very little known on how patients should be engaged in infection prevention activities. I've asked today's panel of speakers to share their expertise and experiences with patient engagement to help inform the larger discussions on how best to involve patients in their own safety and care. I'm delighted to introduce the featured speakers for our webinar today. First up is Dr. Allison Tong, who is an Associate Professor and Principal Research Fellow at the Sydney School of Public Health in the University of Sydney in Australia. Next is Dr. Mark Anu, who is Professor and Chair of the Department of Internal Medicine and Section Chief of the New Mexico VA Health System, as well as Associate Director for the UNM Clinical and Translational Science Center at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine. And last but not least is Ron Crokey, who is a patient advocate and former dialysis patient. Before we get started, there's a few housekeeping items I wanted to cover. We welcome your questions. Please submit any questions or comments you have via the chat window located on the lower left-hand side of the webinar screen anytime during the presentation. Questions will be addressed after all presentations are completed as time allows. If you need help, please press the raise hand button located on the left top hand side of the screen if you need to chat with the meeting chairperson, for example, if you have technical difficulties during the webinar. To hear the audio, please ensure your speakers are turned on with the volume up. The audio for today's conference should be coming through your computer speakers. In addition, the speaker slides from today's presentation will be provided to participants in a follow-up email. Now I would like to turn it over to the first speaker for today, Dr. Allison Tong. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Patel and the Making Dials a Safe for Patients Coalition team for the opportunity to be here to present on this topic on patient perspectives on the prevention and management of infectious disease in hemodialysis units. So as Dr. Patel mentioned, I'm from the University of Sydney, and in fact, I started my research looking, doing a Cochrane systematic review of interventions to prevent infection in uh, perishing dialysis. But then when I was, and as I was embarking on this research, I became much more interested in the patients' experiences, their perspectives, their priorities, and how they actually experience and cope with their illness and also their burden of treatment. Um, but today I'll be focusing on patients' perspectives, uh, looking at infectious disease in hemodialysis units. And I'll be covering the need to understand patient perspectives and also the experiences and perspectives on the prevention and management of infectious microorganisms in hemodialysis units done as part of the Kidney Health Australia Caring for Renal Impairment Guidelines um, patient workshop where we elicited uh, patient feedback to integrate into the guidelines that we're currently developing on this topic and also to outline some implications for patient-centered care. I thought I'd start by showing this framework done by the Picker Institute, which shows the eight principles of patient-centered care. So patient-centered care is defined as providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions. And this definition is taken from the Institute of Medicine. And you can see here listed are the eight domains that are proposed uh, for patient-centered care. So respect for the patient's preferences, coordination and integration of care, information and education, physical comfort, emotional support, the involvement of family and friends, continuity and transition, and access to care. And as you can probably see that you know, many of these domains would apply in the context of infection prevention and management in, he in hemodialysis. Then I thought I'd pose the question, 
Do international guidelines on infection control and hemodialysis units actually address patient priorities, needs and concerns and cover the patient-centred care domains? So we actually did a review of international guidelines, including guidelines from the CDC, the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes Guidelines, the European Renal Best Practice, the UK Renal Association, Canadian Society, Society of Nephrology, and also the UK National Institute for Clinical Excellence Guidelines. And um, in short, most of them actually really focus on the clinical or technical procedures of preventing and managing infection. For example, hand hygiene, uh, personal protective equipment, cleaning and disinfection, isolating patients, screening and vac uh, vaccination. Uh, of note, the NICE guidelines in the UK, they do use input from local patient and public experience for continuous quality improvement to minimise harm from healthcare associated infections, so it's quite broad. Um, with the CDC, it does cover patient education and, ed and engagement and recommends providing standardised education to all patients on infection prevention topics, including vascular access care, hand hygiene, risks related to catheter use, recognising the signs of infection and instructions for access management when away from the dialysis unit. So when we look at this broadly, the guidelines probably do not really cover comprehensively or in detail uh, many of the patient centered care domains. So I thought um, I'd go into, into the literature and see what's out there on patients' perspectives. And there isn't, um, there isn't very much. So the first two examples will be more broad, not in the dialysis Setting. So this was a study conducted by Holy Steel and colleagues in Australia actually, where they administered a survey to 511 patients to look at their knowledge and attitudes towards hospital acquired infections and their participation in infection control. And one of the points and the results is that the majority, 80% of patients would be willing to help hospital staff with prevention of infection, but many would not feel comfortable asking a healthcare worker to sanitise their hands. Another example, and this wasn't conducted in the UK, uh, published by Burnett and her um, team, and they interviewed 20 patients who were diagnosed with staph aureus uh, bloodstream infection. And to summarise their results, patients thought that there was a lack of verbal written communication about their infection status and that was a major concern for them. Patients were not comfortable about asking questions and were reluctant to challenge staff about their practice. So even within these two studies you can see some recurring points. Now the next couple are, were done in the dialysis setting. So this was, um, done, this was the Scottish Renal Patient Experience Survey conducted in the UK. And uh, I'll just point out here, this is looking at patient hand hygiene, and just to point out one of their statements here. So they said 187 of the 1,294 respondents provided comments about hand hygiene, and only just under a third of these were positive. Of the comments, patient and staff hand hygiene drew the most comments, and the vast majority highlighted the variability in the compliance of hand hygiene among both staff and patients. And some also raised concerns about visitors to the dialysis ward not following hand hygiene procedures. And the next one is one conducted actually by the CDC. And they conducted three focus groups involving 12 patients uh, who had current or previous experience on dialysis. And um, identified some interesting themes here as well. Uh, one being ownership and personal responsibility. And one patient said, it is my life. If I'm not going to take care, then who will? And this is in the context of um, infection prevention. And some patients talked about having to be their own advocate for their safety and the need for patient provider partnership. So they said healthcare providers have to invite the patient, empower them to speak up and make it part of that culture. Moving on now into the specific example that I'll talk about. So the Kidney Health Australia Care for Australasians with Renal Impairment Guidelines are evidence-based guidelines. Uh, they're national guidelines um, in Australia. So we conducted a patient workshop to identify patient and also family member perspectives on this topic. So uh, just to provide a bit of clinical context in which these guidelines were derived, we know that patients on hemodialysis are at an increased risk of exposure to infectious agents because of the frequent and extended vascular exposure, immune dysfunction, 
in close proximity to other patients, hospitalization, and being in contact with other healthcare workers. Now, this covers multi-drug resistant bacteria, bacteremia, and blood-borne viruses. And also, um, with infection, it can also have an impact on patient well-being because of the social isolation, they have travel restrictions, and it's also disruptive to care. So the topic, the broad topics that the guidelines cover, and at the moment they are in draft form, it covers the epidemiology of infection, the benefits and harms of screening, transmission-based precautions, and environmental controls. So we wanted to engage patients in this process of developing guidelines to ensure that the scope of the guidelines, the recommendations and the suggestions actually reflect patient concerns and their priorities. So the process runs in parallel. So we have the guideline working group, which is a multidisciplinary team of health professionals who actually develop the guidelines and review the evidence. And so they draft these guidelines and these are fed back the patients and caregivers to attend a workshop. So we present the draft scope and the content of the guidelines to the patients and caregivers. In this workshop, we identify their priorities, their needs, and their perspectives, what they think is important to be included in the guidelines that we're developing. These are then fed back to the guideline working group where they compare those patient priorities with their own draft recommendations. They revise the guidelines to ensure that the topic, the scope, recommendations and suggestions actually address the patient priorities that have been identified in the workshop. And the guidelines are then fed back to the patients for further review and finally endorsement. So what we did was we, recru we recruited patients and family members from two hemodialysis units in Sydney, Australia. We used what's called a purposive sampling to try and obtain a range of age and demographic and clinical characteristics. For example, those who had been screened or diagnosed with an infectious disease or undergoing treatment. In the workshop, we asked questions about their experiences of hemodialysis and screening for infectious disease, and we also asked them to look at the different guideline topics and outcomes. And they used flip charts they discussed, and these were all recorded and transcribed. In terms of the analysis, we actually extracted the topics and conducted a thematic analysis, not only to look at the, what they suggested, but also why they suggested those topics or outcomes or issues. So we had 11 participate in the workshop, nine patients and three family members or caregivers, seven were male, seven had been screened, and four had been diagnosed with an infectious microorganism as listed on the slide. And there is more than um, four in total because of some patients may have had multiple uh, diagnoses. So looking at the new guideline topics, just um, to say that actually some of the topics that they identified, they were quite consistent with what the health professionals came up with. And here I'm just going to highlight the new ones that were identified by patients that were not uh, drafted by the health professionals. So we have the topic of uh, maintaining privacy and confidentiality for disease, for notifying the patient about the disease status, and exchange of patient information between staff. They suggested psychosocial care during and after disease notification, providing information and ongoing support if they were diagnosed, facility transportation to minimise cross infection during the transportation between the dialysis units and their home, uh, psychosocial support for patients who are in isolation, so for example, learning why they are in isolation, um, and also education and engagement. So the impact they particularly wanted to know about the impact of infection on future treatment and also transmission, understanding their own risk to other patients, family members as well. We also covered patient advocacy, so empowering patients to disclose information or to express any concerns about hygiene practice, for example, but in an anonymous way because they don't want to jeopardize their care. Now going through the reasons, um, and I will cover five things that we identified uh, that explains why they raised those topics and issues. So one being shock and vulnerability, burden of isolation, fear of infection, 
for privacy and confidentiality, and also confusion over procedural inconsistencies. So the patients did express some shock and vulnerability about infection. Um, and here are some of the quotations taken from the workshop to illustrate this. They said, when they tell you, they slapped you in the head and you think, how did I get that infection? I thought, where? How? I've been in hospital many times, so when did I contract it? How long have I had it? I had no idea. So this unknown really kind of raised a lot of anxiety. It says, it do and that last quote, it doesn't just affect the patient, it's also the partner, the husband or the wife. It actually impacts the whole family. The next one is the burden of isolation. Uh, the patient says, you can't converse with anybody. You're just by yourself. You feel as if you're in prison, as if you've been convicted of murder and you're in solitary confinement. So there was this sense of um, ostr being ostracized. Uh, the evidence might be you have to isolate patients, but the guideline might say that you, should do to, that you should do to make sure that the person isolated isn't feeling stigmatized, upset, and alone. We could overcome the isolation with giving the patient something to do or to look at. So you're not in there by yourself with a bed and a cabinet and that's it. And a window looking out. And suggested ha giving sort of activity to help them along. They express fears of infection. Uh, they want to know where it's come from and what it's going to do to them. You want to find out answers. It's scary. That education is important. That was the thing about AIDS and HIV. People were just freaking out because they weren't aware of how they could contract it. Yeah. Kind of sense of loss of control as well. Someone else has passed it on to you, so you've got no control over whether you pass it on to someone else. So that was one of the interesting findings that patients were very concerned about passing on the infection to others. Respect for privacy and confidentiality. They said, the doctor comes to your bedside, he's got the screens around and he says, you've got this and this, and we're going to do this and this. The other three patients in the ward can also hear. Another patient said, you should just assume anybody could have it, an infectious disease and make procedures appropriately. That way it takes away a bit of the stigma. And the final one, some confusion over inconsistencies in procedures that they'd observed. They told me to wash my hands, clean up, make sure that it's all sterilised, this and that. But the chair that I'm about to go sit on, somebody else has been sitting on there. How do you know that it's clean? Even the table where you put your coffee, that's not even wiped down. And so just to close, some implications for patient-centred care. And I've also included some uh, extracts from the draft guideline recommendations that were actually included because of the patient input. So the first one being about respecting the patient's privacy, so protecting confidentiality when communicating information about infection status, or providing education, and I know the CDC guidelines also say to do this early on, education of information about prevalence, incidence, transmission of infection, the procedures for preventing infection, and also the impact or the implications of infection, what that might mean for their treatment or their care. Then um, so some of the recommendations that were inserted into the guideline include staff education about maintaining patients' privacy where possible or auditing of hemodialysis patients' opinions about screening, isolation, colonization, and other infection control, and control procedures to identify gaps in education, their psychosocial concerns, their threats to privacy, and so on. And going through empowering patients, so uh, enabling patients to actually express their concerns anonymously so they don't feel like they're jeopardizing their own care or jeopardizing the relationship with the staff. And this is, this is just a um, question taken from the NHS Scotland Patient Experience Survey where they ask, do staff usually clean their hands either by washing them with soap and water or using alcohol gel before treating you? And that was a way that they had um, where patients can provide feedback in an anonymous way. Then finally addressing psychosocial impacts such as stigma, the isolation and the boredom of, um, and also their sense of vulnerability. So one of the statements in the guidelines that were included, evidence about the psychosocial effects and potential harms of screening, isolating and decolonizing hemodialysis patients with the DRE is minimal and that more work needs to be done in, in this area. So with that I'd just like to um, I'll right, then hand you over to the...
Hello, everyone. This is uh, Mark Unruh. I am speaking about patient engagement in clinical research and the lessons that we can learn for dialysis care. I want to thank the CDC Making Dialysis Safer Coalition for the invitation, and I want to thank you all for listening in. My own background is as a clinician and a clinical investigator. I see dialysis patients in a dialysis unit every week. I also do patient-oriented research focused on improving outcomes for dialysis patients. My own experience with engaging patients is largely related to three ongoing studies we have that are founded by PCORI, which is the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, as well as a recent conference, a joint National Kidney Foundation PCORI conference that was focused on getting kidney patients engaged in kidney-related research. For today, I won't be focusing on community-based participatory research, which is the type of science which has the community and the patients with an illness engaged in generating the study question and hypothesis. Rather, I'll be talking about patient-centered research where patients are at the center of the science and are contributing in all aspects of the science, and in that way are very engaged partners in, in addressing the study question. Patient-centered research uh, that we and others uh, engage in has patient boards who are participating in the entire research process. The patient boards can also have regional or national patient advocates. These are often very activated patients who are leaders and advocate for improved clinical care, improved quality care. Um, and actually, Ron represents one of those uh, uh, national advocates and he'll be speaking next. There can also be uh, boards that represent uh, patient groups or Pueblos in my case. This is a picture of one of the Pueblos nearby, which is uh, on top of a mesa. I mentioned uh, Pueblos because I want to point out that it is a terrific asset to have engaged patients and engaged communities when addressing cultural influences and cultural issues that can either impact your clinical care or your science. For me, I practice in an area that has a large number of Native Americans. These Native Americans be belong to around 20 Pueblos, as well as a number of other uh, large groups, such as the Navajo and Apache. And in my practice, I need to be aware of the differences in patient autonomy as well as patient beliefs as it relates to both clinical practice and, and clinical research. Um, a number of my patients that I care for may have different attitudes and practices than a uh, typical Western patient population may. And also, uh, there are issues regarding uh, medical knowledge and communication. The communication can be both an issue of language, such as translation for a Navajo patient, or the type of communication and the nonverbal communication that occurs among the different tribes and pueblos. So for me, having engaged patients that can help me address these cultural issues, both in my clinical practice as well as my clinical science, has been very helpful. The, this slide is a busy slide, and it's my apologies. I just wanted to demonstrate the results of a recent uh, survey of patient-centered research that was published in the journal C. Jason in 2017 with Daniel Sukor as the first author. This survey demonstrated that there's no one perfect way to engage patients in clinical research. Um, if you look on the uh, middle column, how did patients interact with, how did investigators interact with patients, it demonstrated that there was a wide variety in the approach that investigators took to engage patients to participate in the clinical science that they were doing. Um, the patient responsibilities changed as well as their roles over time. So when you're thinking about using these tools for patient engagement and applying them to make your dialysis unit safer, just remember that there's uh, no one perfect way to get patients to participate 
and to engage patients, that it may vary depending on the clinical question or the scientific question. So I'm going to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about one of the uh, PCORI studies that, that is the most uh, advanced, one of the early PCORI studies, and, and talk about it as it relates to patient engagement. The purpose of this particular study was to assess ways to improve end-of-life communication uh, to patients who are at high risk of dying and have end-stage renal disease. We also went and looked at whether an intervention based on the patient feedback improved end-of-life outcomes or improved quality of life and quality of death. As a first step in this uh, study, we went and we did qualitative interviews of patients and caregivers. This was a sample that was both uh, sort of multi-ethnic as well as both urban and rural and had a range of ages. And in this study, what we found was sort of the state of practice now. So we were able, uh, given what the patient said, to gather that our current approach was insufficient. Most patients reported that they had never discussed advanced care planning or had never discussed their prognosis with any member of their dialysis team. Of note, two of the patients would prefer not to have that discussion, but the vast majority of patients that we spoke to said that they would love to have that discussion. Furthermore, the standard practice of completing a form that was handed to them while they were on the treatment was found to be insufficient in that patients were unclear when they were supposed to fill the form out. They were unclear what happened to the form once they filled it out, like where did it go. They didn't receive any feedback on that. In addition, patients were able to provide us with the who, what, when, where, and why of our clinical study. They were able to tell us where we should do this conversation, when we should do the conversation, and who should be present at the conversation. And all patients preferred for their uh, nephrologist as well as a social worker to be present at this conversation. There was additional feedback that I thought it would be important to note for both clinical practice as well as uh, science we found that patients reported their own dialysis experiences and that these dialysis experiences would influence how active they were in their care. Uh, one patient described the uh, dialysis experience as the dialysis just drains me down to nothing, it just zaps me. I'll be good for a couple of hours afterward and then I just sit in the chair and stare. In addition, there were patients that described variable interactions with the dialysis staff, and this actually can really influence the extent to which you're able to engage patients. One patient reported basically that he loved the staff and that there would never be any problems with advanced care planning, saying, I don't worry about it. They adjust it and run it day by day with these nice people. I'm very happy here and never considered making a change. Another patient noted he wasn't sure who his primary physician was. Right now I have a doctor that I basically haven't ever been introduced to. So in a patient like this, it would be very hard to engage in improving the clinical outcomes that we're trying to achieve in dialysis or engaging them in clinical research. For our study, we had a patient advisory board that we generated from from our dialysis units. We tried to select group, a group of patients that was representative of the diversity of New Mexico, and we tried to be sort of geographic variable, and we took people from a number of different units. Because of the type of science we were doing, we had these patients engaged throughout the study. They helped us develop the protocol. They helped us refine the protocol. They provided guidance on how to present our study as well as great ideas for the next study. And we've had a longitudinal relationship with these patients. Of note, there's very important feedback they gave us on how to improve the consent process. Our sister site, who was also recruiting patients and uh, very much a collaborator on creating the clinical study, had their IRB provide guidance that the study consent be read verbatim to the patients. After trying this a couple times at the University of New Mexico, we went back to our patient board who thought that this was an ill-advised approach to providing informed consent. 
the advice they gave was to be open to our patients, to, be, to develop a sense of trust, provide them a brief synopsis and to provide them time to read and digest and come back with questions regarding the informed consent. With this input at the University of New Mexico, we were able to consent twice as many patients as our, as our uh, sister site. And, uh, you know, for us, this was a key, a very key factor in the success of the study, and it was driven largely through the active participation of our patient partners. You know, when we thought about how to engage patients in our research and in improving clinical practice, we thought that given the, that we're drawing a very diverse group, both diverse ethnically, racially, as well as socioeconomically, it would be important to establish rules of engagement, right? So we set up front kind of what we were, what the expectations and commitment would be for the patients. We provided guidelines for interactions with each other. Um, for example, we discouraged people speaking over each other when they were all brought together. We provided them follow-up on the recommendations that they gave us, and we gave them opportunities for additional training. The sort of uh, nuts and bolts are operating uh, an ongoing patient advisory board and improving clinical practice and clinical research involved, you know, first of all, setting out the scope and that it's a longitudinal process. And we thought long and hard about how to best interact with patients, whether it be teleconference, video conference, or face-to-face. -face. And after thinking about it, we opted for face-to-face. -face. You know, we were concerned about patients who would have a hard time hearing or patients that had English as a sort of a second language and had, for example, Spanish as a preferred language. We were concerned about what a, a, an, a teleconference would do to their ability to remain engaged. We also tried to limit the sort of time commitment, given that a number of them uh, had pretty severe illness. We, we didn't want them sitting for several hours. We wanted to like, keep, get them in and out and keep, keep them excited. So with that in mind, we had a limited number of questions for each interaction we had a very simple and straightforward agenda. That said, one thing that we realized after, after a, a few events was that it's hard to get the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday groups together. Um, so with, after realizing that, we would sort of alternate to which days the, the meetings would be held on, and we would have folks teleconference in in order to be as flexible as possible and maintain uh, engagement of, I guess, both sets of shifts. So that was just an operations thing that we learned early on. You know, while it's great to have patients that are excited and have a plan for, you know, involving patients, it's also important to maintain engagement and have a sustained effort on improving your clinical practice. Um, for me, one thing that was really uh, a theme that was really echoed at the PCORI National Kidney Foundation Conference by our patient partners was the need for trust. I think that patients uh, conveyed that they want to have a sense that uh, they're being heard and that we're taking their, uh, what they have to say very seriously. Also, they noted that it's important to have the trust to start with. It's going to be hard to have engaged patient partners if they don't have trust of their physicians or the staff of the dialysis unit. And so just keep that in mind when you're targeting patients for recruitment that you, know, you need to have sort of a, a foundation of trust in order to move forward. Other, other things that I think are important in considering and engaging patients is you should select patients for a longitudinal process for whom the research or the clinical question has important consequence. Patients that have a vested interest in the topic are much more likely to stay committed over time. So you could imagine in this case a patient that has had recurrent infections would be very motivated to help address the issue of, of reducing infections in the dialysis unit and making it a safer place. We also would do our best at each uh, event to prepare patients for their role and responsibilities in the topic that was being discussed. 
you know, one thing you can think about is providing patients some training for how to be engaged. Another approach that we've taken advantage of is having a trained and neutral facilitator for, for these patient engagement events. We have a uh, palliative care physician who's very skilled at communication and can create a safe atmosphere for discussion for the patients. And this has been a terrific advantage in the work that we're doing. And then lastly, it's very important to provide feedback on the, on the interventions that the patients have recommended. Just letting them know what came of their recommendations, if you weren't able to act on them, why? And I think that by acknowledging the contribution of patients, you can build and maintain the trust that's necessary to uh, keep them engaged. For us, you know, it kind of highlighted, you know, one, one way that patients were crucial in, in improving our clinical science. It's also important to note the benefit for the patients. For many uh, patients who are active and engaged, it allows them to be an advocate for both themselves and the larger patient community. It maybe gives them the sense of empowerment to be an auditor for providers, such as Ron, uh, can, as Ron can uh, speak to uh, in the first person. It also allows us to get new ideas to improve our, our culture of safety, to improve how we care for our patients, and to reduce the risk of infection. In this, I wanted to note the recent book by Liz Weissman called Rookie Smarts, the kind of the importance of allowing people without uh, certain expertise to be engaged, to create questions, to think about issues uh, that more experienced people may actually uh, overlook. And in this, uh, there's a nice quote from uh, Liz Weissman that experience is not the enemy, it's hubris that is often the byproduct of experience that is our greatest enemy. So it's my hope by having engaged patients that they'll ask the tough and focused questions that we as dialysis providers need to address and also keep us honest as far as providing them a safe place to receive dialysis. So for me, as a, a physician who takes care of patients, I think you know, rather than relying on my own expertise, I try to take the approach of becoming a student of safety, going to patients, going to staff, and trying to learn about how we can make our dialysis units a more safe place, how we can improve the patient experience. And I think that by both you know, engaging patients as well as the staff, that you know, we can go a long ways to improving the safety of our units. It is also terrific to have patients as a partner in providing high quality of care. They can help sort of set the expectations and culture of the unit. Um, they can provide the feedback on the experience of care, whether good or bad, and provide important ideas as well as inspiration for ongoing improvements. I mean, the patients that I have involved in my studies and the patients that I care for really have provided the inspiration for my science. And I want to note that uh, at the end of this talk, there's a, a web site that has the TED Talk of Eric Dishman. And Eric Dishman is a kidney patient who found at a young age that he had uh, cancer, then later had a, had a second diagnosis of related of uh, kidney disease, who told a story of how he became activated and, and, and engaged in his own care at the behest of another patient. And Eric Dishman went on to have a 17-year career at Intel in the interface of improving, improving medicine. Recently, he took the job of, at the NIH of leading uh, our precision medicine efforts, how we can target care to each individual. And, you know, I'm not going to tell you that every patient you care for is going to be an Eric Dishman, but he is an example of what an active and engaged patient can do for, our, for the ability to provide good care. And with this, I'll uh, move on to another active and engaged patient. Hello, everybody. My name is Ron Crocky. Um, I'd like to, first of all, thank the CDC for giving me this opportunity, and I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank all of you all for everything that you do for uh, patients like me. Uh, I'm sure that you're not thanked nearly as much as you should be, um, and 
people need to understand that there are pe- patients need to understand that there are people that are actively involved in trying to improve their care. Um, my experience with uh, CKD and ESRD is uh, back in 1988, I was diagnosed with uh, FSGS, and I was an extremely healthy, active person, and uh, proceeded to uh, have uh, CKD for uh, 11 years, and in 1999, my kidneys failed, and I started peritoneal dialysis. I was extremely active and, uh, as a PD patient uh, until 2009 when I <clears throat> uh, contracted severe peritonitis, which led into septic shock, and then switched to in-center hemo. In 2011, after being on dialysis for uh, 12 years, I was asked to join the Southeastern Kidney Council, Network 6, uh, as an SME, and then followed up on the board. At that point in time, after that long being on dialysis, I had no idea that networks even existed. Um, subsequent to that, I was also uh, I've now been in, actively involved with the CDC, uh, the core team for the making dialysis safer for patients. I'm also on the was on the board for the uh, National Kidney. Or I'm sorry, the um, Southeastern Kidney Council. I'm on the divisional board for the IPROS Network of the South Atlantic. I'm also an advocate for the American Kidney Fund and National Kidney Fund. I'm also a subject matter expert for the National Kidney uh, Council, um, the national level, and also a Fresenius uh, TOPS speaker and fundraise for the American Kidney Fund and National Kidney Foundation. Uh, after 16 years of being on dialysis um, and having 99.9% antibody saturation and told I couldn't get a cadaver, a kidney ever, it had to be a living, and that would even be a, an issue, of course. Um, on October 15th of 19, or 2015, I received a cadaver kidney, and <clears throat> it's been working uh, fantastically well. Um, my personal experience on peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis is uh, regarding infection control and how the whole process happens. Um, when you, of course, when you go on peritoneal dialysis, you receive extensive training for both you and a partner. Uh, mine was my wife. Uh, I did the quantum. I had five exchange, uh, five three-liter bag exchanges for during the day, one at night on the quantum, which uh, no longer exists, and then also switching over to the subject, uh, the cycler uh, for the, the same volume. Uh, in center, on the other hand, when, it's, when I switch to the emo, in center, of course you get training and you get uh, uh, information, but unfortunately that information is immense. It's very thorough. Uh, it's immense, but it also, the immensity of it precludes almost comprehending it all. And the follow-up um, of what that information is, I found uh, to be lacking. Uh, you're in a situation where you're on the, at the chair, you're, you're drained, you, don't, you just want to get through with it, you don't want to bother you just, with anything, you just want to uh, basically get the treatment over and done with and then move on, go to take your nap and then take care of everything else. Um, patients should be trained on how the process sh- should happen on the floor. Um, there certainly is a procedure that every dialysis facility has on how, what, how the staff should um, conduct themselves when they walk on the floor before they come to a patient. And the patients, I could almost guarantee you, in the 90 or percent or greater, have no idea what that procedure should be. Um, informing patients of what that procedure should be, is, for me, it was critical. Uh, everyone knows what's expected. Everyone knows that uh, how the staff's supposed to you know, handle themselves, wash their hands, what they're supposed to do in between patients and glove, regarding gloves. Um, but also along those same lines, staff needs to continually inf- inform the patients what their expectation of them is. When you walk on the floor, you're supposed to wash your hands and wash your sight. At the dialysis facility that I was at, I was literally the only person that uh, did that um, on my whole shift. Um, the the expectation wasn't there that I needed to actively participate in that. Um, there needs to be a, a follow-up, more better follow-up on what the procedure should be. Uh, I'm not sure if a quiz would be appropriate or if it's something that just information should be uh, dealt with on, a, on an individual basis, on a, on a monthly basis with uh, the staff. Uh, networks have a, a great opportunity to, to engage patients and, and regarding the campaigns that are exhibited on a continuous basis, but again, I had no idea that the, the uh, campaigns didn't, uh, the net, that the networks even existed. Um, additional campaigns uh, that, that stress this involvement, patient involvement, uh, such as know your numbers and what your, what your lab results are, are fantastic, and 
very, very moving to me to be a part of it because you actually understand what you're, what you're expected to be doing. And then if you understand what those expectations are, you can have an idea whether or not you're, you're meeting those expectations. Um, the infection prevention knowledge and understanding is, is, is out there. Uh, the, the key question is how to involve and engage patients. Some things that I've, I've found that uh, were very challenging is that patients don't, they have reservations on bringing up their concerns. You guys have big needles and we want to get on, we've got to, we want to get on the machine, we want to get in and we want to get out of there. Um, but if there's a concern brought up, uh, there's a concern that you're not going to get put on the machine quickly enough. Quickly enough, and also there's just a you're, you're a captive patient. Uh, the one way, to, the best way, to, in my opinion, to reduce fear and anxiety is to make them part of the process, especially if their patients are involved in the audit process. The CDC has a great process uh, sheet to follow on what the state auditors and what what what's expected. Um, I was involved in our audit process one time, and um, it was it was disheartening the results that I found. Two weeks later, this, this state auditor came out and gave them gave my facility a 100% success. I mean, the, the children act uh, better when their parents are involved. Just the same that when your 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 authority figure is in front of you, you're going to follow the procedures. That was great because they obviously knew the procedures, but weren't following it unless they were being watched. If the process is uh, set up that the patients know what the process is supposed to happen, and the staff knows that the patients know, and also that the patients are, are clearly uh, determined on how, what the expectation on them is. When they walk on the floor, wash your site. When you're not at, on the, in the facility, wash your site. Take care of it. Look for infections. It becomes a self-policing situation where patients and staff, everyone knows what the expectations are, and if someone isn't doing something, if a patient walks to their chair without washing, you know, staff can come over and say, hey, you need to wash your, wash your access without any concern whatsoever of anyone getting angry that's just what's expected and just the same that if someone comes walking over to you to uh, push a medicine or to uh, to access you know, to stick you with the needles or to deal with your catheter and they don't wash their hands you know it's just a simple statement of hey you didn't wash your hands and it was simple oversight someone's busy and didn't understand what they were doing that's very very normal and and it'll just become a whole culture that everyone knows what's going on and everyone works for the same goal um, some of the solutions are every clinic should have a patient advisory board. Uh, mine didn't, I, although I was heavily involved with them. Um, we didn't. I think that would be critical to any success with involvement with patients and getting them to feel that they're part of the process. Also, training needs to happen early in the treatment. Everyone gets in there, you start to get trained, your blood pressure adjusts, uh, you get tired, you're watching TV, you just want to go to sleep. Um, so if, if the demonstrations on, on what the proper procedure should be, such as the hand washing, is a simple example. Beginning of the, the shift, someone should say, okay, everyone, listen, this is, we're going to give an example of when a nurse or a tech or staff is, comes on the floor, this is what should happen, and dem physically demonstrate the washing the hands, and if they go to one patient, then they should throw their gloves away, wash their hands again. If they're coming back to another patient, to do the process. Let people see what the process is. Also have a patient come on. When I walk on the floor, after I get off the scale, I should do this, and then I should do that, and uh, demonstrate to everyone uh, on a monthly or quarterly basis how the process should happen. If that happens, then you, again, everyone is understanding of what the, what's expected and what, what is the best practices that should occur. Um, it, it encompasses everything is encompassed in knowledge. If they know what's expected, then they'll, they'll follow it. Um, some of the key resources that to help facilitate infection prevention and understanding are demonstrations. Personal, physical uh, demonstrations in front of you. Uh, the, the one thing I would like to stress over and over again is that an active and involved patient will almost always be healthier and happier than a non-active patient. And as Mark mentioned, the healthier and happier a patient is, it's not just affecting them. It's affecting their family and everyone that they're involved with. My son's look at me is not a, a you know, poor guy that just had such a rough thing. I was a beast when I was on dialysis. I exercised like crazy. They saw me overcome this horrible situation, and it motivated them. Other, other patients that I would write letters to and talk to, they looked at me and said, wow, I can do this. And if you see someone having success, 
uh, it, it's a great, great motivator. That's why if we had a patient advisory board on every staff, there would be patients that are taking the situation and their, their circumstance by the horns and then succeeding in it. That, that is profound and very effective to patients. Staff can tell you all they want about what this you should do and that you do. If a patient says it, it matters more. And with that, I'd like to thank you all again for all that you do. Um, again, it's most like, mostly a thankless job, but uh, understand that there are people that do deeply appreciate all your efforts. Thank you again. Thank you, Ron, Mark, and Allison. This is Preeti Patel again. I have just a few slides, and then we'll, we'll uh, try to get to some questions and answers. On this slide is a screenshot of a patient conversation starter tool that CDC developed together with the American Association for Kidney Patients as a way to facilitate conversations between facility staff and patients about infection prevention. The format for this tool is actually questions followed by additional context, not the answers. And you can see from this very first question that it focuses on how the facility involves patients and their family members in infection control activities. For example, are patients encouraged to speak up when they see a concerning practice? So this is meant to be sort of a prompt to initiate a conversation and get people to think about um, what is happening in the facility with respect to these various infection prevention topics, including how are patients involved. The tool is available on our website, and we encourage you to print it out and try using it. We also have a new resource that accompanies the tool. Uh, for facilities that use this tool, we've created the certificate shown that facilities can print out and display to show that they have engaged patients in using the conversation starter and encourage other patients to have the discussion as well. So we encourage you to take a look at this um, and print it out and consider using the conversation starter. Next, we're going to move to um, some questions. We've uh, received a few questions um, that we're going to that we're going to discuss. Uh, one, I believe, was directed to um, Dr. Tong, which uh, was a question about whether your guidelines address the risk of central venous catheters and how to reduce the risk associated with central venous catheters. Ah, so the guidelines that we're currently working on on preventing infection in hemodialysis units. Uh, the vascular access infection is actually beyond the scope of those current guidelines. They're just in a different guideline. Great, thank you. Um, another question that I think might have been addressed to Dr. Unruh but could be answered, I think, by um, Mark or Allison is, uh, what did you learn from patient involvement in research that would inform patients' involvement with clinical practice? Either of you have any, I think that was included in your presentations, but either of you have any specific things that you would highlight as lessons learned? Yeah, Allison, I, I can start this one off. I think that, uh, you know, as Ron pointed out, having a patient advisory board is a, a nice tool to engage patients. I think that, you know, when we thought about it, having patient advisory boards for our clinical science was also very helpful. And the lessons learned were that you have to sort of create the expectations and, and sort of the rules of engagement uh, for the patients. Uh, in addition, I think it's important to provide the feedback to the patients and, you know, provide them the data with how, how, how their efforts are reducing infection and then, you know, continue to challenge them to come up with ideas to improve care. Allison, do you have anything else? Um, in the context of our work, certainly the patients are involved in the development of the guidelines, but these guidelines are designed to be implemented in practice. So we're hoping that the issues around, you know, confidentiality, empowerment, um, the isolation, the stigma will also be, you know, translated into practice as, as well. Another question that has just come in is um, that I think is open for any of the presenters is what is the youngest patient that you've involved in any advisory capacity? Does anyone have any experience with um, pediatric patients being on an advisory board? Um, this is Mark. I, I do not. I think that the youngest would be, you know, a young adult in our case. Ron, have you encountered any um, young 
patients, pediatric patients, in your uh, capacity as an advocate? Uh, not at all, to be honest with you. Um, another question for Ron. Um, do you know if your clinic has reported better infection prevention outcomes as a result of your advocacy um, and the facility and patients addressing infection prevention? Uh, the actual specifics, no. But I do know that um, my, from when I started the facility to, to, to current, because I still visit them regularly, um, the, there's a different tone. Uh, there's a different... Uh, involvement from the patients um, and partly <clears throat> they attribute it to me involving engaging them through letters and uh, personal uh, contact but uh, I think that the staff also uh, viewed that uh, saw the benefits from uh, patients becoming more involved that they've now uh, actively pursue patients to be understanding of what's available to them and what, what, what the opportunities are and how thing, important things are because their success in, in seeing a patient that is um, dealt with infection or dealt with a catheter situation and then going to other catheter patients and saying, hey, you really should get rid of that because it's, it's not something that um, it, 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 the potentials are too great for you to have harm. Um, so, but the specifics as far as if they've improved, I've, I've actually never asked that question. But I, I can't see how it couldn't, to be honest with you. Thanks, Ron. Uh, a few other questions. One is, um, Ron, is there anything that you could suggest to help patients feel comfortable in sharing with their dialysis clinic staff um, their concerns about infection control practices or how they should feel comfortable asking staff to wash their hands, for example, or change gloves? I guess the, the, the thing for me, what was disheartening is, is when I would see that there was a particular nurse that would come push heparin to everyone without gloves or without washing their hands. And I'd stop him. I'd say, no, you need to go wash your hands. I brought this up to the clinical manager, and, and, and nothing happened from it. And when I did the CDC audit, uh, I never got a response back. But like I said, the, two weeks later, they got 100 from the state auditor. <laughs> and so the, I, I guess what will be important is that if a patient brings up a concern, that it's addressed and that they, uh, the patient is given feedback on thank you actually for bringing that up. And uh, we've, we did this about that. We talked about this. I wanted personally to go into the staff meeting. Unfortunately, I, well, not unfortunately, but I, I got a transplant the month I was supposed to go talk to staff about how important it was. I love those people dearly. Um, and I thought it would be powerful to me to stand in their staff meeting and say, listen, you know, there are two people on the staff on my shift that do handle this proper procedure. Everyone else uh, is lacking in this, and we need to work together to make sure that everyone stays as healthy as possible. You're, you're affecting our health, and uh, you, it's important so that they would hear it physically from me and not just have it be a rule that they're supposed to follow. So um, I think the, the, the most important thing is that it, use their information uh, have a sit down even if it's if it's if it's a particular person that, that that's that's um, not following the proper procedure and then let everyone uh, be straight and honest with each other and know what the procedures are and then uh, act accordingly. Thank you, Ron. There was um, a request to show the the link for the patient conversation starter again. So we're showing this slide. You can also go to the making dialysis safer for patients. Coalition main page and look under resources, uh, and that's where it's located and can be printed out. Uh, we're going to do one last question, and then we're going to uh, move on to some uh, some wrapping up information. Uh, the last question was about whether hand hygiene tools were for staff or for patients, and I will uh, attempt to answer that question. So. We, have, we at CDC have a hand hygiene audit tool. That's a tool that can be used to assess hand hygiene performance by staff, primarily is how it's intended to be used. However, um, it can actually be performed, the observations can be performed either by staff or by patients. So we don't dictate who actually performs the um, audits of infection control practice, including hand hygiene, uh, but it's important for whoever is doing it to actually be educated on how to use the tool. So thank you all very much for um, your questions. And before we close, I'd like to announce an upcoming webinar hosted by the American Society of Nephrology, Nephrologist Transforming Dialysis Safety Initiative, entitled Targeting Zero Infections, Where Do We Begin? 
This webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, May 23rd, and you can register for free at the link shown on this slide, which will be sent out with all of the slides after this um, presentation is concluded. And uh, before we uh, finish, I would like to mention a little bit of continuing education information. To receive continuing education, you must complete the and pass the post-test activity with a score of at least 80% and complete the webinar evaluation. When you close out of the webinar, a post-meeting web page will appear that will have detailed instructions about completing the continuing education post-test and evaluation. For those on the phone who aren't currently logged into ReadyTalk Online, to obtain CE, please go to www.cdc.gov backslash TCE online. The access code for this webinar is WC0502. If you are listening to this webinar as a recording, the access code will be different, so please check the Tune Into Safe, web Safe Healthcare webinar page for instructions for uh, claiming continuing education. A follow-up email will be sent out this afternoon with detailed instructions about completing the continuing education post-test and evaluation. With that, I'd like to thank our speakers as well as all of you for taking the time to join us today, and thank you for your commitment to keeping your patients safe.